Yes, the title is the Poetry as a Science Fiction of Today, of the Present, of, of Today. It's not uh, science fiction as uh, the uh, poetry of today. I have to be uh, very um, explicit about it. Why? Because, of course, as you know, uh, science fiction is prose and uh, poetry is uh, likely to be uh, poetry. So this weird uh, topic I have to explain. You may be a bit frightened by the, uh, the idea of uh, um, defining poetry uh, as a, a sort of a prophecy, prophecy. But I have to, uh, to say that um, uh, a famous uh, philosopher surprisingly uh, claimed, recently claimed, that uh, poetry is a, a prophecy. And guess who it is? It is Alain Badiou. But it surprised me a lot, because Alain Badiou is well known for uh, 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 telling people that poetry is very important, but uh, that poetry has uh, not um, as many powers or strength as uh, it is supposed to uh, to have. That poetry should not be uh, uh, told to uh, be capable of uh, uh, knowing things about uh, the, our times or about the future. Well, he, uh, he's, um, he just recently in a book called uh, in uh, search of the lost real, he uh, says, he exactly says so, and uh, I still am very surprised he, he, he said that. I will translate it uh, live. Il n'y a que deux choses dans l'activité des hommes qui soient prophétiques, la poésie et les mathématiques. There are only are two uh, things that uh, in man's activity are, which are prophetic, poetry and mathematics. Poetry, la poésie, parce que tout grand poème est le lieu langagier d'une confrontation radicale avec le réel. Un poème extorque à la langue un point réel d'impossible à dire. Which may be uh, translated this way, poetry, because every great poem is the linguistic, the verbal location of an argument, a radical argument, with uh, the real. A poem extorts to language a point of real, uh, a real point of uh, about an impossible to be said. And uh, of course this definition in a way is orphic. It uh, assigns a lot to uh, poetry. So it's a philosopher who uh, wanted uh, poetry to be uh, separate uh, from philosophy, who uh, at the same time uh, now assigns, or at times assigns, uh, uh, an, a strength uh, um, to poetry and uh, an ability to um, announce or foresee or for, uh, uh, foresee at least, um, our future. Hmm? I have to say that uh, in my perspective, uh, I wouldn't use the word pro prophecy. Um, maybe I'm too uh, uh, Kantian, uh, but I would be very cautious in that matter which doesn't mean that uh, poetry cannot foresee or say things about what we may see already in our present. Uh, 
foreseeing is not uh, immediately the same as prophecy. But anyway, uh, in Badiou's perspective, prophecy is linked to a, a lack or a gap or a hole in our present. So uh, in that uh, uh, in that sense, maybe uh, foreseeing is a kind of prophecy. The metagnomic, as we call it today, the metagnomic uh, strength or ability of a, a poem, a real poem, or a genuine poem, is at stake anyway. How uh, can uh, a poem uh, uh, help us to see what's happening, what's about to happen, what's uh, actually already happening, uh, even though we do not see exactly what's happening? Well, uh, the answer may, be, uh, may concern, may uh, describe uh, the form of uh, a poem, because uh, the form of a poem is not to be uh, um, detached from the way it uh, declares what it has to declare. And I will say a bit about my uh, uh, conception of what uh, a poem should be at, uh, on, uh, to this respect. But second, we have to, uh, to uh, understand what that form actually uh, conveys or uh, expresses and, and uh, of course when we mention the descriptive power of a poem we have to meet, we immediately have to meet someone who is unavoidable, uh, who is Baudelaire. Why, why Baudelaire? Before uh, speaking of uh, um, our possible conception of a poem nowadays. Why, why Baudelaire? Baudelaire, uh, as, you, as you know, um, had a very uh, specific um, understanding of what description is. In his uh, letter to uh, a letter, uh, which is also a preface to the Petit Poème en Prose, Arsène Housset, he uh, spoke of a kind, a very specific kind of description, which is the one uh, poetry uh, should uh, adopt. He speaks of uh, the exact uh, translation is uh, this one, of a description of modern life, or rather of a modern and more abstract life description of modern life, or rather of a modern and more abstract life. This uh, phrase, of course, uh, had been uh, a lot uh, commented upon, and uh, I will not uh, uh, comment uh, except uh, for uh, uh, saying that um, this description he uh, aims at and he uh, uh, wishes, actually, is an abstract one, an analytic one. Hmm? And this uh, uh, conception of poetry and art in general as an analysis of the material given by uh, a time uh, of course, is a, a very strong and powerful and far-reaching one, which doesn't mean that uh, uh, our wish may come true easily, right? But his uh, definition of genius in Le Peintre de la Vie Moderne, uh, the painter of modern life, modern life, is very interesting uh, uh, here. 
Genius is only childhood recovered at will. That's a very famous definition of genius. Genius is only childhood recovered at will. Childhood now gifted to express itself with the faculties of manhood and with the analytic mind that allows him to give order to the heap of unwittingly hoarded material. To the heap of unwittingly hoarded material. It means that everyone is sensitive to what's happening, to uh, our common material, to the heap of unwittingly uh, material. But uh, the equipment, he also speaks of an equipment, required to uh, give order to that material uh, is that of a strange genius, which is analytic analytic genius, which also mean abstract imagination, imagination that is capable of uh, analyze the constantly uh, coming uh, material. So we all are sensitive to that uh, material, but we uh, cannot have access to uh, the truth of what's happening uh, lest we uh, have a sort of uh, excess disposition to uh, that uh, precise material. Childhood recovered at will. Hmm? At will. Will uh, plays a very critical part in that process. So at the same time, we're active and passive towards the material that uh, is constantly uh, coming to us. We have no choice. You know, T.S. Eliot said, prophecy to the wind, to the wind only, for only the wind will listen. Prophecy to the wind, to the wind only, for only the wind will listen. What does it mean? What uh, does that sentence um, mean to, to us? To my mind, this sentence, which uh, is not uh, very uh, kind to mankind, Uh, has to be connected with another sentence which I much prefer by Emerson. The air is full of men. The air is full of men. So prophecy to the air, but the air is full of men. We all breathe the same air, but we uh, do not uh, behave the, the same way. We may, uh, of course, understand why uh, some kind of uh, literature or, or text uh, is likely to uh, reveal uh, some connection, some uh, possible relationship to what is happening, to uh, the event or the events that are constantly uh, ready to uh, ready to happen. So, what I want to to um, to tell you tonight is, um, at the same time, um, how a poem may use uh, the prose of the world and some proses in the prose of the world, some science fiction proses, such as uh, um, Philip K. Dick's and ballads, so that we may say that some uh, powerful proses are pre-poetic, in a way. And uh, second, 
I would like to um, suggest a, a few things about uh, the uh, condition, conditional orphism that may be uh, preserved or maintained nowadays as far as poetry is concerned and as far as verse also are concerned. My general uh, idea about that, which is an inferred uh, idea, I expressed those ideas in the chapter 12 of uh, Art Poetique, which was uh, asked by uh, Barbara Cassin and Alain Badiou, pre precisely. The book just came out uh, uh, recently, uh, Contre un Boileau, in the 12th chapter. I already uh, spoke a, a bit about that. But tonight I want to add a few things about my uh, intuitive ideas or inferred, inducted uh, ideas. Especially about uh, the kind of uh, dystopian admonition uh, a poem is likely to uh, um, um, address. Dystopian admonition. How a description of what's happening, an analytic description of what's happening, how can it at the same time address dystopian admonitions? You know what dystopia is. Dystopia is the, supposed to be the contrary of a utopia, meaning that uh, we uh, depict then, uh, in a, a poem depicts, may depict, just like uh, K. Dick does in his prose or ballad, may depict the uh, a sort of uh, a world that that is uh, um, well uh, that is uh, frightening, right? But the point is to under to understand that the dystopian admonition that be that can be. Uh, involved in a, a description of the future world is only it interesting to us if it has a deep and uh, a connection to our present and that connection may be precisely analyzed so that a description may be in itself a kind of admonition. You don't have to tell people Beware if you don't behave the, the right way, if you got no political conscience and so on, you, the world will go, uh, will fall apart. And to my opinion, that's why a, a poem in its uh, strange and uh, ancient form, uh, uh, made of uh, free verses, for instance, uh, maybe the location where this description can be uh, intensified and may be addressed to uh, prosaic uh, uh, contemporaries. We all are uh, prosaic. Uh, I must tell you immediately, I am. For instance, what is a stanza? Hmm? What is a, a stanza? A stanza, if we quote uh, Vielle Griffin, à propos du vers livre, speaking of the free verse, uh, 1890, a stanza is an analytical stanza. Verses are a typographical, logical analysis of a period. Mokel, propos uh, sur la littérature, 1894, it is logically an analysis that determines the limits of modern verse. Divisions of stanzas are in agreement with the natural division of a sentence. And so on. So, to my mind, a, a poem is a, a kind of sensitive reasoning that has to... Uh, be uh, conspicuously uh, 
analyzing, lively uh, an analyzing a material in the uh, series of sentences or in a long sentence, for instance. I mentioned the um, the proses, the special science fiction proses that are pre-poetic, that are uh, um, incredibly su suggestive. I mentioned Philippe uh, K. Dick. And, uh, of course, uh, a writer is what uh, he is when he has special, very uh, accurate and specific uh, ideas of about what is to be done. And, for instance, K. Dick wrote uh, a few uh, essays about uh, what science fiction... He didn't like the, 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 the phrase science fiction to uh, call what he did, but he spoke of his imaginative ideas. Imaginative ideas. And he also said that uh, his prose is interested in the present of the present. The present of the present. Meaning, uh, let's remember uh, of uh, Baudelaire, that the present in itself uh, is not easy to uh, understand. It's not because we live in a world that we uh, understand it. Uh, you know Hegel's uh, famous sentence, uh, one is uh, in the best case of his time. In the best, best case of his time. It's not easy to be, uh, to belong to a, a time. So the present of the present is the, the object, the uh, supposedly object of the prose. And uh, of course we may, uh, uh, if we adopt a cognitive perspective, we may uh, wonder whether uh, literature is able to to know or to make people know anything. And we may uh, uh, wonder uh, whether um, literature uh, is able to deal with an ens imaginarium in the, uh, the Kantian sense, an empty data for a concept. But that's another story and I, I will not uh, only speak as a philosopher, let's say, tonight. I would like to mention the, the imaginative ideas that are available in some proses and that are very helpful to poetry. Because to my mind, poets should <laughs> more often read certain proses. It is quite paradoxical to say that because we are surrounded by proses and proses constantly are, are uh, Food, but uh, some proses should be read by poets, so-called poets, supposed poets, and many, many poems should be avoided. <laughs> so I will speak of uh, K. Dick, of uh, uh, his insight, his uh, imaginative ideas, and for instance, it's more than an instance. I uh, found that in uh, his, uh, especially in his uh, uh, famous text, uh, Minority Report, that he had an incredibly insight uh, on uh, the, the issue of interiority, of subjectivity, interiority. And to uh, cure, to heal the uh, lyrical disease that uh, oftentimes affects many, many uh, poets. Lyricism is not a disease in itself, but the lyrical uh, disease uh, is that of, uh, uh, Hegel spoke about that, uh, is that of a, uh, an interiority closed in itself and uh, incapable of uh, uh, precisely becoming the outside uh, material. 
the world itself. In Minority Report, K. Dick shows the appearance of a police of intention. And what is implied and not expressed in his uh, incredible uh, prose is the what we call the uh, antinomy of uh, intentions, or the antinomies of intention, uh, and those uh, uh, this issue of uh, intention may uh, intensify our lyrical, our own lyrical intentions and the expressive tension of any poem. Of course, it's uh, a way to, to read a prose as a pre-poetic uh, material itself. As you know, in the Minority Report, the police uh, ends up condemning a criminal intent as a crime. A criminal intent is a crime in itself. And the new police, the police, the police of uh, intention, criminalizes interiority. So we shouldn't, of course, behave like a police of intention to criticize poetry. That's not what I suggest. But if we imagine that our own intentions, our own uh, realm of intentions, our interiority, is something that is not likely to be uh, looked at and to be uh, criminalized, we are completely wrong. So poetry itself is not uh, a realm or uh, an area that is not uh, uh, likely to be uh, accused of uh, dangerous uh, things. We oftentimes define poetry as uh, um, a space where everything is uh, uh, allowed, uh, a space where someone may express himself freely and may uh, um, let his uh, uh, supposedly pure uh, intimacy express itself? Well, that is uh, very uh, questionable. So, you know, the, the way I read uh, uh, K. Dick is not a very uh, uh, immediate uh, one, but uh, it's obvious to me that if we read uh, K. Dick's other uh, essays, he had in mind all the problems of uh, interiority. And I would like to, uh, to quote uh, uh, certain, uh, certain things about that. For instance, in 1978, Dick uh, says uh, the in a, in a text called How to Build a Universe That Doesn't Fall Apart Two Days Later. How to Build a Universe That Doesn't Fall Apart Two Days Later, which in itself is a, is a title that uh, at the same time um, is uh, severe towards all the, the uh, utopias and to the dreams, the so-called poetical dreams. And he says, uh, uh, exactly, science fiction writers, I am sorry to say, really do not know anything. We can't talk about science because our knowledge of it is limited and unofficial 
and usually our fiction is dreadful. So it's very interesting. It means that science fiction is not science, uh, and I uh, quite agree, poetry is not science. But what we call a, a, a poem is a sort of uh, language that has a, a real responsibility because of his uh, supposed ability to uh, intensify a reasoning about our present, about uh, what's, what's happening. So I, I could uh, translate this sentence by Dick uh, saying, uh, poetry writers, I'm sorry to say, really do not know anything. We can't talk about science because our knowledge of it is limited and so on. But in science fiction, you have science. It's quite different. He quotes John Donne, No man is an island. The exact uh, text by John Donne, so a poet, in Devotions Upon Emergent Occasions, uh, 1624. No man is an island, entire of itself. Every man is a piece of the continent, a part of the main. If a clod be washed away by the sea, Europe is the less, as well as if a promontory were as well as if a manner of thy friends or of thine own were. Any man's death diminishes me because I am involved, involved in mankind and therefore never send to know for whom the bell tolls. It tolls for thee. So uh, Dick quotes uh, a poet a prose uh, written by a poet saying that, of course, we are all a part of uh, uh, the same air, same continent, and we all are uh, uh, practicing or uh, playing a risky game uh, every day. Baudelaire uh, said, realism il y a. Such thing as re realism uh, there is. Uh, Baudelaire was an enemy of realism. What is really dangerous in our lives is that we uh, are supposed to believe that we know our reality. But the, the reality we all uh, share is of course what is uh, very difficult to, to convey and to analyze. K. Dick, saying that no man is, is an island, after John Donne, adds, but giving that theorem a twist, that which is a mental and a moral island is not a man. He proposed to give a twist to that theorem. That which is a mental and moral island is not a man. So the question is, that's in another text called Man, Android and Machine. When uh, uh, is someone, anyone, a man? That's the question. Although we all breathe the same air, we uh, uh, all are sensitive to the same uh, material, constantly uh, uh, provided to us. K. Dick therefore defines the poem, if we read it this way, and he adds, if we hold now no pure categories of the living versus the non-living, uh, what is to be thought then? A question arises even to an early science fiction work with which we are all familiar, and it is the Bible. 
a question arise even to an early science fiction work which, with which we are all familiar, the Bible. But it is not ourselves that we know uh, first and foremost. We have to penetrate into the essence of the subject matter and its innate tropism. And uh, K. Dick um, claims that we should, uh, to have access to our uh, innate tropism, tropisms, we should, uh, we should know that the future part has already started. The future start has already started. He says, Reality is not so much what we perceive as much as what we do. It should be created before it creates you. Reality should be created before it creates you. The future world is not one place but one event. This means that history of noise and fury is of special importance depending on the work of inspired and precognitive. Precognitive. Uh, he uses this uh, word precognitive and it's very striking because in Minority Report, the precogs, as you, say, uh, you all know, are the, those people completely passive that are used by the police of intention to uh, discover the uh, possible uh, uh, people that are, have uh, the intention to kill or to do uh, uh, this or that thing to a society that is uh, supposed to be uh, um, to, to be protected. So a writer says that in his writing some kind of uh, imaginative ideas have a sort of pre-cognitive uh, strength. Of course, this uh, poetic precognition is not scientific. But it's not either vaguely intuitive, because the material we uh, constantly uh, receive is uh, a real one. <laughs> His, uh, not to be denied. He has to be construed, yeah, it has to be uh, put in order, it has to be analyzed in a sensitive way in a, in a poem or in literature, but it is uh, something that uh, is to, likely to be checked. So, when I speak of uh, metagnomic strength of a poem, or when I speak of uh, dystopian uh, admonitions addressed by a lyrical analytic uh, stanza, for instance. I, uh, uh, I feel very close to, uh, to K. Dick because uh, in poetry which he quotes, he quotes Don, he, he constantly is fed with uh, uh, poetry. Uh, in a poem, of course, uh, it would be very uh, easy to uh, uh, see only ethical propositions and uh, uh, intentions and uh, vague uh, ethical uh, sentences put together and uh, um, uh, pathos uh, being the way to adorn uh, very vague I intuitions. But actually, if we bear in mind that a description, an abstract description of uh, the material is precisely what uh, poetry has to do, uh, at least since uh, Baudelaire, but probably uh, uh, he's not the first one to, to say that, we may have, for instance, the idea that uh, to uh, and it may be surpri surprising or amazing to uh, a poem as an elegy, uh, elegy of today, may uh, 
uh, give us some material, uh, may uh, analyze some material of our time, elaborating at the same time something like what I call a regret of the future. A regret of the future is not a way to uh, um, justify uh, self-realizing prophecy. If poetry is just a self-realizing prophecy, crying before the event, or being sad of something that has not yet happened, of course poetry is, is not uh, very useful or very interesting. But the regret of the future, isn't that exactly what is given to us in uh, literature, in uh, its dystopian uh, admonition, especially in, uh, in Kadic, for instance? And to my mind, uh, it's an Hegelian, this time an Hegelian uh, ins uh, uh, idea. Uh, even though poetry uh, can uh, carry on, uh, resist to the prose of the world, it has to uh, uh, accept the fact that it is, it's only the prose of the world that give, gives poetry its uh, content. Another uh, quotation by uh, 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 Kadic that was uh, and still is very, uh, um, to me, it's, it's a, and I, I think to us, it's a, a very a striking incentive. The notion that for now, we see through a glass darkly. You know the sentence, the famous sentence in the first epistle to the Corinthian, 13.12. Kedic said, for now we see through a glass darkly. Could not possibly be rewritten one day as, for now we see, we see through an infrared scanner, darkly. I repeat the sentence. For now we see through a glass darkly, could not possibly be rewritten one day as, for now we, soothe, we see through an infrared scanner, darkly. But, if, and only if we see, that this rewriting has already begun, we understand why we can say one of these days uh, the, the Corinthian uh, sentence, for now we see through a glass darkly, may be rewritten. It already is rewritten. So we have to uh, understand that our the way we behave towards the first uh, book of science fiction, the, the Bible and the, the other books that comes from, from it, are already rewritten in our reality. We s if we understand that, we already see things according to Kadic. But I think, I think it's quite uh, interesting. The scanner he says, isn't really capable of understanding interior desire because interiority is a sphinx analogous to a computer which answering to the question posed would devour the questioner. Rather than learning more about ourselves by studying our constructions, rather than learning more about ourselves by studying our construction, wouldn't it be, says Kedic, wouldn't it be better trying to understand what goes on inside our constructions by examining what goes on inside ourselves? Uh, I think it's, uh, this sentence 
is very, very, uh, very interesting. It's not against science, it's not against uh, technology or, or technique in itself. It just says that uh, um, we, we have to examine uh, the content of our constructions by examining without avoiding uh, to examine what's happening inside ourselves. So much uh, for uh, Kedic. And now uh, Ballard. Like uh, uh, Kedic, Ballard uh, gives us a pre poetic uh, material too. And uh, he, for instance, he uh, inter interrogates the, what he calls the myth of the near future. The, the myth of the near future. Future has already begun. And like uh, Kedic too, he has imaginative ideas. In Kedic you, you can find some uh, uh, motives very, uh, uh, very fascinating and uh, pre-poetic. Prescient magazines, counter-talents, uh, semi lives and so on. But you found uh, such kind of ideas, of uh, imaginative ideas in Ballard, and those practical ideas, what I call those practical ideas, are precisely the linguistic material he uh, deals with to uh, analyze what is uh, coming, what, what's already uh, happening in our world. So we may uh, completely mistake what he describes, Ballard, in his uh, um, so-called science fiction proses. Because his only aim is, uh, it's not uh, pure fantasies or uh, arbitrary fantasies. Because he's uh, and that's why also Burrow was very interesting in Ballard's prose. He, he says uh, he's interested in the fact that the line of demarcation between the inner and outer landscapes uh, has already begun to uh, vanish. He speaks, <coughs> and it's uh, if we have a close look at it, we understand that it's precisely against surrealism, against uh, those kind of fascination for uh, inner fantasies. He says <coughs> that we are, we live in an increasingly surreal world. Which, which is uh, negative. The most extreme fantasies, I, I quote, the most extreme fantasies of science fiction and comic strips have become commonplace reality. To the point that the outer paysage, landscape of our existence, becomes more and more fictitious. And he says, he also says, <clears throat> the relationship between reality, i.e. <clears throat> the world of work, of commerce and industry, of our personal relationships with one another, and the universe of our imagination, our dreams, our hopes, our ideals, and so on, has now almost completely been inverted. the relationship between reality, i.e. the world of work or commerce of industry, etc., and the universe of our imagination, our dreams, our hopes, our ideals, and so on, has now almost completely been inverted. So that's why we, we, we may say that Ballard, for instance, 
accurately determine the strength of a non-prophetic visionary text that intervenes in the general movement of a life directed, I quote, towards the total fix fictionalization of, our, of all experience, of that of the exterior environment or of the world inside our heads. And it would be, of course, very uh, uh, forgetful to, uh, or it would be very silly to forget what, uh, a po uh, what part poetry itself played, had played in that uh, uh, fictionalization. Another quotation, the world of published events, the domain of our interpersonal relationships and the interior universe of our spirit is exactly uh, what should uh, deliver, sh should uh, uh, um, make appear what he calls a new psychology. I don't know if I would uh, use this, the same uh, uh, phrase, but he uh, dreams of a new s responsible psychology. The epoch itself, he says, imposes a three-dimensional atlas and navigation in the deep waters of the experience of each of us. The deep waters of the experience of each of us. And that uh, investigation into the experience of each of us, of course, uh, necessitate an investigation of our uh, own relationship to language of everyone's relationship to language because everything uh, begins in uh, everyone's language as Emerson uh, used to say. Ballard's uh, preface to Vermilion Sands displaces the banal uh, sentence by Salvatore Dali a landscape is a state of mind that's Salvatore Dali's uh, sentence. He says, a landscape is not a state of mind. And he uh, precisely uh, refuses to, utilize, to use the situations of traditional science fiction extraterrestrial planets, futuristic landscapes, and, as he says, acting behind the scenes as an elf of the uh, automaton of history, a technology. That all, that's, that's exactly what he refuses. His literature, the literature as he uh, uh, imagines it, has to deal with our real commencing landscapes. And he says, the no nostalgic piazzas of Chirico are actualized and translated into functional multi-story car parks. The new landscape is created with someone, uh, <coughs> within someone as an exotic suburb of his spirit, Antibes translated into the Sahara. On the beach, despite pelagic fantasies, allusions to the shore, sand, reefs, rocks, and other elements of the decor, there is no sea, or rather, there is an absence of sea. So the landscapes are just ours, a bit modified, but this modification is uh, already available in a way. 
So that's why uh, his motives, his pre-poetic motives, his assortment of imaginary creations, for instance, singing flowers, sonic sculptures, sculptures of clouds, metallic gardens, all those motives are not surrealistic at all. Even houses sensitive to the mood of the inhabitant. Ballard mentioned that, but that's already possible. Houses sensitive to the mood of in the inhabitant. Well, I do not want to be too, uh, too abuse of your kindness, but uh, that is why uh, I happen to uh, uh, to use uh, some, some those kind of uh, 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 proses in my uh, stanzas, uh, analytic stanzas, refusing nevertheless to uh, agree with Baudelaire when Baudelaire wanted us to get rid of uh, verses to uh, create uh, a new kind of prose poem. I will read you uh, uh, a passage by Baudelaire and then, and then if you uh, allow me to do it, I will read you a bit of a translation of a poem of mine, so I'm not responsible for the poem you will listen to, because it's an English one. First quotation by uh, Baudelaire. The idea came to me to try something analogous to Gaspard de la Nuit, applying to the description of modern life, or rather to a certain modern and more abstract life, the procedure he, Aloysius Bertrand, applied in painting a life long gone strangely picturesque, which is exactly not the, the aim, the goal of Baudelaire. He doesn't want to uh, depict a long gone uh, world. Which of us, which of us, has not, in his ambitious days, dreamt the miracle of a poetic prose, musical without rhythm or rhyme, supple enough or and striking enough to suit lyrical movements of the soul, undulations of reverie, the flip-flops of consciousness. Above all, it's from being in crowded towns, from the crisscross of their innumerable ways, that this obsessive ideal, ideal is born. Having you yourself, dear friend, Arsène Ousset, to which he addresses the letter, not attempted to translate into song the strident cry of the glazier and to express in a lyric prose all the distressing possibilities his cry sends even to the dormers through the street's utmost haze. And now, uh, an English poem. He sees an island of broken glass, great of jewelry, stretching from Vancouver to the rest of Earth. It continues Calvino, the idea of a crystal land, or ballad inscribing the images of the multiplied orchid. Crystallographer is personalized? No. He is absenting himself from the reflections of reflections. And furniture, wrapped in glass, cells and reflective portholes towards the glazed forest. Cher Bartid, in low definition, visualism is separated without noise. Why? I didn't understand my poem completely but it's supposed to be mine. Thank you.